welcome to the SIBO Doctor Podcast with Dr. Narala Jacoby, a US-trained naturopathic physician and director of SIBOtest.com, an online breath testing service and education portal for practitioners. In this podcast series, medical experts join us to discuss functional digestive disorders, clinical practice, and research as it relates to small intestinal bacterial overgrowth and associated conditions. This podcast is intended for SIBO treating practitioners and aims to help educate how we may best serve our SIBO patients. If you're a practitioner and want to learn the basics of SIBO, head over to the SIBOdoctor.com for SIBO education such as the SIBO Fundamentals course, masterclasses, group mentoring and much more. If you're a patient, please know this information is not intended to diagnose or treat a medical condition. Please ask your doctor before initiating any new treatments. And now, over to Dr. Jacoby and the SIBO Doctor Podcast. Welcome SIBO practitioners to another episode of the SIBO Doctor and I'm really delighted to have with me Dr. Carrie Jones, a naturopathic doctor speaking to me from Portland. She is, um, everything hormone related is basically her, her area of specialty. She completed a two year residency in advanced women's health, gynecology and hormones, and also completed her master's of public health at Grand Canyon University. Um, and she's been the medical director for two large integrative clinics in Portland, although she's currently Currently on a hiatus from practicing, but she is the medical director at Precision Analytical, a uh, lab that offers the Dutch profile for you practitioners who are using that. I'm, I am using that. It's very, very helpful to nut out some of these hormonal problems that our patients are facing. And um, she is quite prolific in her writing for different health websites, and I've seen her on different podcasts. And um, yes, she seems to be uh, the word out on the street in terms of uh, who to talk to when you've got issues with hormones. So I'm really happy that you could join us today, Carrie. Thank you so much. This is going to be a lot of fun. I think it will be. Um, and so one of the reasons I thought it would be fantastic to have you on the podcast is really talking about hormones and their relationship to what we see in not just SIBO, but generally functional digestive disorders. And we know that hormones are um, at play often in our uh, female patients because they are IBS symptoms flare up before their periods. And, um, you know, they, they just have to, they generally have more digestive issues. So can you kind of start the conversation by talking about the main hormonal imbalances or patterns that you see in patients with IBS. Yeah, absolutely. And you absolutely hit the nail on the head. We hear women all the time say, as I get close to my period, I feel I have a lot more GI issues. I have more constipation or diarrhea um, or around ovulation. You know, they'll say, what, what's going on? Why am I having all these digestive changes? And it's very tied into hormones. And I would say the, the two um, or I guess three, but two biggest things I see that the gut directly relates to hormones. One is any kind of inflammation, any kind of gut inflammation you have, whether it's SIBO, whether you have a microbiome imbalance, doesn't matter. It really can affect all of your hormones. I mean, it will it will raise your cortisol. It can raise your estrogen. It can raise, we call it, there's an enzyme, it's called 5-alpha reductase. And that can lead to things like acne and facial hair and hair loss on the head. And it can actually lower DHEAS. So just by having gut inflammation, you can make a shift in all of those things. And then the other thing, of course, is malabsorption, which you talk about all the time. But if you're just not absorbing, you're not getting those nutrients, you're not going to make those hormones very well, or you're not going to process them very well. Mm. Yeah, we definitely see that in terms of, um, we've talked about that with other with other doctors on our show in terms of how LPS and endotoxemia can impair or, or use up different liver pathways. And so is that what you're talking about, where phase one and phase two are... Um, uh, are sort of impaired? 
Yeah, definitely. So what happens, um, you know, like estrogen is a prime example. So you make estrogen and then, you, as you know, you have to go through phase one and phase two detox to get rid of it. But if you're missing specific factors, for example, you know, the, the, the SNP, COMT, which makes the enzyme COMT, clears estrogen, right, through phase one to phase two. But if you don't have enough magnesium, if you don't have enough of your methylated uh, B vitamins, if, you do, if you're not making SAM, you're not going to clear your estrogen through COMT or COMT. And then you're going to be having all this excess estrogen floating around your body and you'll be estrogen dominant and you can be estrogen dominant in men or women, right? Men get breast development and they get the belly and they get erectile issues with too much estrogen, just like women get PMS and they get tender breasts. And we, you know, we worry about estrogen dominant cancers all because you're maybe just missing out on absorbing certain nutrients. Mm. So besides, um, sort of an estrogenic dominance pattern. Do, are there any other hormone patterns that you see that are maybe not necessarily related to inflammation or absorption, but um, is there some interplay with the microbiome perhaps and a dysfunctional microbiome that influences these, um, these patterns? Oh, absolutely. There's, um, there's something called the astrobolome um, in the intestines, and it can dictate how much beta-glucuronidase that you have. And as you know, beta-glucuronidase is what um, can make estrogen that's packaged up and ready to be basically pooped out of the body cut free and recirculated. And so for those people who are having a disruption in their microbiome, I mean, that alone, that all the bacteria that are making this beta-glucuronidase will greatly affect their estrogen, but it will also affect other hormones like DHEA. Your DHEA that might be packaged up and ready to be excreted out of your body is suddenly cut free, reabsorbed and circulating. And now people say, I have all this acne on my chin and, and I, or I have a lot of anxiety or I have a lot of anger or I'm losing hair. I'm getting like male pattern baldness. What's this from? And it turns out it's not from the ovaries and it's not from the testes. It's, it's from the gut. It's, it's the, the response of the hormones from the disruption in the microbiome. Hmm. So, and I, let's talk a little bit more about DHEA because I think, I don't think we talk about it enough because it's sort of the maybe the dark horse, you know, <laughs> sort of where we, we, estrogen, everybody understands it. I remember, you know, 15 years ago when I first came to Australia, I did a lecture on uh, estrogen metabolism. And so it seems like we've, we've kind of understand that fairly well now. And the, um, well, maybe just for the sake of, so we, we get a lot of practitioners that may not be that familiar with it. Can you just perhaps before we move to DHEA, let's kind of talk about estrogen metabolism a little bit further and And, and the different breakdown products or metabolites that can be produced and what's the beneficial ones and, and how do they get metabolized? Yeah, absolutely. And it's, you know, proper healthy metabolism is so important. So the body makes estrogens, your, your primary estrogens are E1 or estrone and E2 estradiol. And then once those are done and your body needs to get rid of them, it pushes them through phase one detoxification. And you have a couple of options. You can go down what's called the two pathway. It's called 2-OH or 2-hydroxy, um, the 4-OH pathway, and then there's a 16-OH pathway. And that entire, one of those pathways, whichever you know ones your estrogens choose, that's, con that's considered phase one detox. It's the two pathway, the 2-hydroxy pathway, that's considered the healthier pathway. That's the pathway that you want to go down. The 4-OH pathway is the one that if you keep going down the pathway will actually increase the risk for estrogen dominant cancers. That 4 pathway is can, called the quinone pathway with a Q and it can lead to increased um, mutations and, and damage to your DNA, which of course can lead to cancer. And then the 16 pathway, we used to hear a lot about the 2-16 ratio and, and that effect for cancer. And it turns out that ratio is not actually so true anymore um, now that we know more about the 4 pathway. But the 16 pathway is what I call proliferative. So if you have high levels of 16, then, and, and you have cancer, it can, of course, make the cancer grow or proliferate, 
but it makes other things proliferate too. It can make your, your breasts bigger and tender and feel swollen. It can make the lining of your uterus thicker. So you have, um, heavier periods and a lot of cramps. And, and so that's, that's your phase one, your two, four, 16. And then what you need to do is that send those through conjugation, which is part of phase two detox. And of course the enzyme involved there is COMT. And so when you go from phase one to phase two, you switch from an OH or a hydroxy into a methoxy. And now it's water soluble and can be excreted out of the body in a safe manner. So that's your kind of make an estrogen, get it through phase one, try to get it down the two pathway, try to avoid the four pathway, make sure your COMT is working, get it water soluble and then get it out of your body. And hope that there are not too many bacteroides species that increase right. beta glucuronidase. I had a patient the other day that had something like 23,000 on a beta glucuronidase. And just, I've said it before oh. at podcast, but but just for you uh, listeners out there who are unfamiliar with this, and Dr. Jones just mentioned it, but is this enzyme that is produced by certain bacteria that basically unwraps this whole um, estrogen package that's meant through meant for excretion and therefore increases your estrogenic pool once again by absorption or absorbing, reabsorbing the estrogens that are meant for excretion. So that also begs the question then, if if we see this sort of uncoupling of estrogen, which I think is also the sort of endocrine disruptors that kind of also get packaged up through this pathway, isn't, isn't that right? It's, like It's true. Yep. The plastics and the chemicals and the toxicants. Yeah. Mm. Do you see, and actually I've never really actually asked this question, but I, I think I know the answer, but when you have a patient that, let's say, has a very high toxic load, um, whether that's phthalates or other solvents and um, polyaromatic hydrocarbons and all these other bits that do affect our CYP enzymes, do we actually see um, a corresponding rise in some of these estrogenic metabolites or are they just sitting on receptors and act like estrogens? So they do sit on the receptors and act like estrogens. Um, unfortunately, in most traditional um, hormone testing, it the, the um, these chemicals, uh, these endocrine disruptors don't show up. There is a specific test that you have to run to see if you have these chemicals uh, in your body. But um, if you're just running like an estradiol, uh, it's unfortunately because they just sit on the receptor, they're not actually going to raise estradiol levels. Now, what they may do is just what you've said, they may actually affect the ability of CYP. So even though the ovary is making normal, healthy levels of estrogen, all the solvents and just the poly, uh, the PAHs and, and the phthalates, they will affect the CYP. And then we may see, oh my gosh, this person is favoring the four pathway or the 16 pathway, which again, not pathways you necessarily want to go down. So it won't necessarily raise estradiol, but it will affect the way that normal estradiol level is dealt with in the body. So we could conceivably have somebody that displays to uh, talk, well symptoms of estrogen dominance, but their profiles are actually okay. Yes. Mm, yes. And tricky. we actually see this a lot because as you, as you know, you know, it's the, um, it's ubiquitous, ubiquitous mm. in our environment. And so it's really hard as a man or a woman, but primarily a woman to get rid of these chemicals and to avoid them um, and manage just plays havoc on our hormones. Mm. Um, so lots of questions, of course, come out of that. Like, <laughs> A, what do we do about it? And um, and I still want to nut out exactly how it ties back to the gut in terms of symptomatology. Like, how does that actually, how do we start to differentiate between somebody who is in an estrogenic state and has... I mean, there's, you know, this is what I love about naturopathic doctors is we are used to thinking laterally. We don't just think of one thing. We think of all the possible mechanisms that can be involved in the, in the development of something like that. But it is important to sort of understand uh, when to intervene in terms of hormones, right? Rather right. than just and kind of harping the same thing, it's IBS or it's SIBO. It's like, when do we do that? Right. Absolutely. And so a lot of it, of course, is your extensive patient intake that you're doing. So you're talking with, with your patient or your client and they're telling you about their intestinal 
concerns or issues, their IBS, their, their gas, their bloating, their distension or constipation, diarrhea. And oh, by the way, they also happen to have all of these hormonal symptoms. And so when you test and you may see they are estrogen dominant and you start to dig back like, okay, are you estrogen dominant because your ovaries are making too much for some reason? Are you estrogen dominant because it's a detoxification problem? Are you estrogen dominant because your intestinal, you know, this this um, beta glucuronidase in your GI is, is much too high, and so that is causing estrogen to recirculate. So it's not an ovarian problem; it's a gut problem. And in that case, when we see a high level of beta glucuronidase, often I will tell people, like, leave the ovaries alone. It's don't blame them. You you have to go after the gut. Go there first because mm-hmm. that. That is causing all this estrogen to recirculate. And if you just keep throwing, you know, um, herbs for the ovarian support and missing the gut, you'll miss it completely. You'll, they'll never get better. Mm. Yeah. And thanks for saying herbs, by the way. Um, yeah, you like that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I appreciate that. Um, <laughs> Uh, okay, so I totally agree with all of that. And do you actually, I can't remember now of the Dutch, because I usually do the beta glucuronidase, the fecal levels, uh, but do you guys measure that on the Dutch program? We do not. No, mm-hmm. I, I recommend a fecal. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yep. Um, so uh, talk to us about what can we do about estrogen dominance? I mean, we all have our own little favorite treatments, but I, I actually, I didn't mention this, but Carrie and I met at uh, one of the conferences we did here in Australia. We had to think back for a minute because we do so many conferences, but <laughs> it was, I think, the A5M conference uh, earlier this yep. year. And, uh, you know, you had a great pr- presentation, which really led me to bringing you on this podcast. And you talked a little bit about what um, we can do. It's beyond just dim right methane, but yes yeah maybe walk us through that a little bit yeah absolutely so i mean dim is great don't get me wrong so if you have a if you have a client or a patient who um, is favoring that unhealthy four maybe the 16 pathway the the dim or methane is one of my top choices so that what that will do is that will help shift the phase one detox over to the to the two pathway to the healthier pathway now of course there are there are other things that help with phase one for example dietary wise we're looking at broccoli and kale and cauliflower and brussels sprouts those all contain um indole 3 carbonyl i3c which of course goes on to make dim um broccoli sprout powder uh, is or eating broccoli sprouts really super high in something called sulforaphane. And sulforaphane is what help activates another enzyme called quinone reductase. And that will, it's a stop gap. So when you have a, when you have somebody going down the unhealthy, the cancerous four pathway, eating broccoli sprouts will help reverse that. Like it's, it's such an easy thing to do. And, and broccoli sprouts are so healthy for you. And then the second stop gap after that is, is glutathione. It's the GST, um, enzyme glutathione sulfur transferase. And so supporting glutathione with, you know, N-acetylcysteine or, uh, NAC, um, or even doing liposomal glutathione can be helpful. Now that's phase one. So phase one treatments are very, very different than phase two. Phase two, um, are things that support COMT. So we're looking at things like magnesium, um, methylated B vitamins, methionine, choline, SAM. Um, That helps all get things from phase one to phase two. And then, of course, gut treatment is entirely different. Gut treatment, when we're looking at beta-glucuronidase, the the common supplement we use there is called calcium deglucurate. And everybody thinks, oh, that's calcium. I'll get calcium from that. And it's not, believe it or not. It's just, it's in the name. Um, It's something totally different. But Mm -hmm. calcium deglucurate, and then, of course, you know, fiber, fiber, fibrous foods, vegetables, eating extra fiber to bind up all that estrogen that's free floating, but calcium deglucurate can help lower beta glucuronidase um, as, as you're as you're working to clean up the intestines, clean up the microbiome, eradicate, you know, work on the SIBO. Um, so it can be really helpful. Mm. But it's three different treatment areas, and so that's why I tell people don't just throw everyone on DIM, just because DIM's only one out of three, and I, maybe it's not a phase one problem, maybe it's maybe it's a gut problem, or maybe it's a phase two problem, or maybe it's both a gut in phase two and then dim will make no impact whatsoever Mm, mm -hmm. and maybe it's just that they have to get away from their toxic load of you know like i can think of things like nail salons you know with their (laughs) 
you walk oh in there goodness. and it's like, oh my God, how do you people actually live in this kind I of know. environment with this toxicity? Um, but yes, it is a, a big concern uh, in terms of that those levels are really rising uh, in all of us, really, the endocrine disruptors. Um, okay, that's that's great. Now let's talk about, I had another question, I'll come back to that regarding um, estrogen detoxification, but I think that will suffice for now. So uh, progesterone. I know yes. that some people, oh, I think that's what it was. I just wanted to kind of mention about uh, both broccoli and fibers product, not so great in phase one of SIBO treatment. Definitely mm. consider um, as a um, adjunct treatment later on. I, I use a lot of um, binders. I do do that. And for those of you listening, a uh, great podcast with Chris Shade was actually a couple mm. of podcasts ago, who, who is like the king of binders, right? So he, mm -hmm. he really understands binders very well. And it's about not just mopping up extra estrogens, but it's also really about endotoxicity and heavy metals, et cetera, et cetera. So binders are wonderful and you have to know when to utilize them in your treatment and, and so forth. Okay. So progesterone, because, you know, one, I had a conversation with um, Alison Seebecker about progesterone and we talked about how some people that get really terrible bloating are actually progesterone deficient. Is that true? Yes, it can be. It Tell, can be. How does that work? Why, why is that the case? So progesterone um, is, oh, this is what, how I describe it. It's the calming, relaxing, everything's going to be okay, anti-anxiety hormone and women. And so what can happen is progesterone can have that similar effect on the intestines, on the digestive tract. And if you're If you're deficient in progesterone, then you may have a more what I call like wound up intestinal tract, which you usually feel more wound up. You're more anxious and you can't sleep and you're more on edge when you're deficient in progesterone and, and the gut just follows suit. And so by improving progesterone, you may actually help your intestinal symptoms. Mm. Yeah, I've um, I've sort of recommended that a lot more since I've had that conversation. And sometimes it's it's really the thing that helps people get over their bloat um, because we've all had patients that we've been treating for SIBO, they've cleared SIBO, and yet they're still bloating. You know, it's mm -hmm. kind of an interesting mm -hmm. phenomenon. And um, I work a lot with microbiome restoration and large intestinal mm -hmm. issues. So that's I'm not a stranger to that phenomenon. But but I never had kind of thought about just using um, a hormone uh, and and kind of um, aiding or using progesterone cream second part of the cycle. Would you recommend that over, you know, in that scenario where somebody is really bloated, for example, would you go to Vitex or would you go just straight to progesterone cream after you've established that progesterone is low? You know, it depends on the, it depends on the person and depends on their age. So if it's a woman who should be ovulating. So the only way a woman makes progesterone is when she ovulates, when she kicks out an egg. What's left over is called a corpus luteum or corpus luteum, and it produces progesterone. So if she's of an age, let's say she's 26. I'm like, you know, I could absolutely use progesterone with her, but I usually try to do Vitex first for a couple months. And sometimes I'll use them together. I'll say, let's use Vitex to improve the communication from the brain to the ovary, get you a stronger corpus luteum, get you more progesterone um, endogenously, but we'll use progesterone in the second half. It's kind of a band aid and to really help your symptoms until your brain ovary figures it out. Now, if she's older, if she's in her forties where I know she's probably not ovulating anymore, um, forties and above, then generally I don't use Vitex. I don't find it as helpful. I will go right to progesterone. Mm. Mm -hmm. Good, good call on that one. Like I, I got to think that, I mean, I do do the Dutch test on a lot of patients. Let's kind of talk about that for a second, because I think um, it's imp uh, important to kind of understand the differences between different biological substances and what you're actually testing, right? So what's the difference right. between saliva, hormone testing, blood testing, and urine testing, like with the Dutch Absolutely. So the Dutch test is that we're a dried urine test. So people will urinate on um, these strips of paper through the day and let them dry and then, you know, of course, mail them in. So just like in blood and just like in saliva with dried urine testing, you can get all your basic hormones. You get your estrogens, you get testosterone, DHEAS, you get your progesterone. Um, but the bonus is because it's urine, you get 
all the metabolites. So once everything has gone through the liver and is coming out the other end, that's how we can see estrogen metabolism phase one and phase two. We can see androgen metabolism, which is which way does your testosterone go? Which pathway? Which pathway is your DHEA going? We get to see melatonin. We get to see um, your cortisol metabolism. We get to see if you favor cortisol or inactivated cortisone. And so because again, it's urine and it's, it's after everything that's come after through the liver, we see how your body's processing. At the same time, we get to see how it's actually making the hormone. So you just get a bigger picture. Hmm. So with blood, it's bound to basically um, carry a protein, like sex hormone binding globulin, right? Um, yes. And you yep. don't measure that on a dried horm- on a dried urine. The, the, all the binding globulins have long since been destroyed before they show up in the urine. Mm-hmm. They're, they're long gone in the, in the extracellular matrix. Mm-hmm. So the binding globulins don't get through the liver. It's just the free right. um, Makes sense. and available. Right. Yeah. So it's same if, with saliva, right? Like saliva is just picking up the free hormone. Yeah. Um, because the theory is that the, the binding globulins don't get down the capillaries. The, the hormone mm-hmm. sort of gets off the bus and goes down the capillary. Mm-hmm. So just to recap, saliva is free hormones, blood is bound to SHBG or other carrier proteins, and then the Dutch or dried urine hormone is more metabolites. Yeah. So we do the free and we do metabolites. You get both. Ah, yeah. Okay, great. Yep. And then you also have this great, uh, what is it? Eight hydroxy D guanosine or something for <laughs> something, something. Yes. <laughs> I know who names these things. My yeah. goodness. Yes. Eight O H D G. So eight hydroxy two deoxy guanosine, which is a super big fancy name for a marker that tells you how much oxidative stress and DNA damage you have going mm-hmm. on in your body. Mm hmm. Yeah, I learned about that marker probably like five or six years ago from um, uh, Walter Walter Crinian, Dr. Walter Crinian, Crinian. Who, yeah, yeah, who who works a lot with environmental medicine. Okay. Um, Let's kind of go, I, I haven't forgotten about DHEA, uh, but I want to <laughs> talk about high <laughs> cortisol and cortisone because that is really, really interesting um, of, and how to assess that. Um, so it's beyond just an adrenal stress index of looking at total levels of or the rise of cortisol and more at the interconversion between cortisone and cortisol. So yeah, yeah tell us more about that. So what happens is the body makes cortisol and cortisol is active, right? That's what goes and does things like helps your inflammation and deals with your stress and manages your blood sugar rises and falls. But different glands and different tissues can determine if they need cortisol or if they should inactivate it to cortisone. Cortisone is essentially bioactively dead, dead in the water. So what can happen is most of your glands tissues, everybody in the body can decide, you know what, we're going to flip to cortisone. We, we need, we need to be, have more, you know, dead. So let's be cortisone dominant. And then what that means is you don't have an adrenal production problem. You make cortisol. You're just deactivating all of it to cortisone. So it's a conversion problem. And what happens when you have too much cortisone? You're tired because it's dead in the water. And so people may think, oh, I have quote unquote, you know, I have adrenal fatigue. I don't make cortisol. I'm like, well, actually you do. You just, you just convert it all to cortisone. And why does that happen? I'm sort of, the, yeah. The two biggest reasons, one is long-term stress when the body is trying to get you to slow down, rest and heal. When the body's over it, dealt with it, done it. So like, okay, we're flipping a cortisone. And two that I see all the time is after acute illness. So think about when you have the flu, you have a fever, you've had the shakes, your, your joints ache, you feel terrible, and then you get better, but you're not totally better. And you go back to work and you do things like go up the stairs and you're out of breath and you're really tired and you think, you know, I probably should have taken another day off. But if you've done, if you've done the Dutch test or if you've tested your cortisone, you'd see usually your cortisone's a lot higher. And what it is, is it's a healing, it's a healing thing. The body's going, Hey, you just had the flu. Like 
sit down. Don't go to work. Like you still need to heal. Stop burning the candle at both ends. And so it's real interesting. It's actually a protective mechanism in the body to say, you need to be tired for a while. We need to force you to slow down. We don't as humans, of course. We just keep pushing. But <laughs> we just drink it. We just drink another cup of coffee. Right, um, exactly. <laughs> so okay. So if it's a protective mechanism, and so in other words, if cortisol is high and cortisol is low, that is what you're talking about on a Dutch profile, right? Yes. So yep. what what do you do? You know, I mean, I can think about from my naturopathic brain of what I would do, but what would you do to kind of encourage the conversion or the, the not the conversion to cortisone and, and have more cortisol around? I, I mean, right. barring so, having, you know, I mean, having things or reasons that you've just mentioned, like convalescing from a flu, for example. But if it's right. like, a, if it's a state that's just chronic and ongoing, do you just give adaptogens, for example, and, and are there specifics that you do? I, specifically licorice. So um, glyceriza in licorice uh, inhibits the enzyme that converts cortisol to cortisone. It, it turns it the other way to make cortisol. And so in that case, when you have that uh, conversion issue, licorice is a really great one. Of course, you have to make sure, be careful of things like blood pressure and low potassium. But um, that's the number one herb that that I'll use to, mm-hmm. to get them back into a cortisol state. Uh, assuming they're, you know, recognizing they need to take care of themselves and get rid of some stressors and, you know, sleep and do stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I was at a really interesting conference. Um, well, or I heard a very interesting talk at a conference about flatlining cortisol and it actually being a marker for chronic infection. Um, yeah. You know, what are your thoughts on that? It's a marker for, it can be a marker for chronic infection. It increases your risk um, for um, problems with cancer. And it increases the risk for autoimmune when you have flatlined cancer, or flatlined cancer, flatlined mm. cortisol, mm. the other C word. Yeah, because yeah, that spike in cortisol in the morning, because you, when you wake up, when you open your eyes, your body will drive cortisol up in about the first 30 to 60 minutes. It's called a cortisol awakening response. And if it doesn't do that, that spike is what helps trigger the cells in your thymus gland, not thyroid, but thymus, that are tagged as autoimmune. So when you when you have immune cells that are, are developing – and before they get sent out into circulation, the body double checks them for autoimmunity. And the ones that are accidentally autoimmune right off the get-go should get pulled aside and they should get destroyed. And part of that destruction happens with the spike in cortisol. It helps trigger that. But if you're flatlined, then those autoimmune cells don't get destroyed and they slink right out the thymus and now they're circulating around your body. And so I will definitely have people say, I feel like my autoimmune symptoms are worse or I can, I can tell, um, lately, you know, I'm having a lot more autoimmune symptoms and we'll do cortisol testing on them and I'll go, yeah, you don't, you don't get the spike in the morning. You're missing that. Hmm. That's really interesting. I didn't know about those, um, that there is a correlation between autoimmunity or the autoimmune cells not being destroyed. What this presenter had talked about was that um, when you have chronically high cortisol uh, due to stress or other factors, you actually can't really properly initiate an immune response. And so as a response to a chronic infection that the body will actually reduce cortisol in order to activate its immune system, which I was, I thought that was so fascinating. So rather than going in there to try to raise cortisol uh, because the person is fatigued, that may actually be, you know, counterproductive. Um, And I certainly have seen a lot of flatlining uh, with my SIBO patients. Now, whether it was SIBO or another other stealth infection that caused it or this the the ongoing stress you know it's hard you can't just go by the one cortisol um mm-hmm. sort of test but it, it i do see a correlation with those that have chronic infections and low cortisol yeah absolutely and then as you as you know when people who do have high cortisol when they do are when they're constantly in that high fight or flight stage, it just shuts down their whole intestinal system, right? Mm-hmm. When you when you're fight or flight, you can't rest and digest. And so you lose out on all that blood flow into your intestines and and you you often get digestive issues and you and you malabsorption and you know gas and bloating and constipation. Mm-hmm. And it's all 
it's all stress response. It's all stress related and people don't even realize that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's... (laughs) There's a lot of that going on, that's for sure. Okay, so yeah. let's let's loop back to DHEA. Talk to DHEA. us about DHEA. We're I love talking DHEA. about the adrenal, so it's an appropriate <laughs> time to to mention DHEA. Absolutely. So DHEA. So there's DHEA and DHEA S. S is the sulfated form. So primarily, most of your DHEA is made in your adrenal glands. A little tiny bit is made in the testes in men, and believe it or not, the ovaries in women. So So DHEA um, is one of your counter stress hormones. It actually can be made in the brain to counter the effect of cortisol damage in the brain, which is really super cool. So the body makes DHEA and then it converts it to DHEAS, which is kind of a holding pattern form of DHEA. And then when it needs it, it takes the S off and then it becomes DHEA and DHEA swims downstream and it can make androcinodione, which goes on to make your testosterone and which and also goes on to make estrogens. DHEA is great for things like bone health and energy and mood. It has it has um, a big interplay with like dopamine, um, which is, of course, one of your great neurotransmitters. It helps with um, sex drive. It helps with muscle development. It's it's really important, of course, in balance too much DHEA and then you're at risk for acne and anger and irritation and facial hair, but not enough. And you may lose out on bone and brain production and good energy. So we need our DHEA. So, um, isn't there like, um, what is it? Seven keto DHEA? That's... There is seven keto. Mm-hmm. So seven keto is actually made. It cannot convert into DHEA. Once, once you have seven keto, um, it, it's done. It's, it's an irreversible conversion back to DHEA. So seven keto does not raise DHEA. Mm -hmm. Because that's a supplement people take. And so it's what is it mm -hmm. to prevent uh, from going down the androgenic pathway? That's what people will try to use it for. They'll also try to use it. You'll see it gets uh, mentioned a lot on uh, popular TV shows about Mm. with weight loss. (laughs) Mm. You'll see that all the time, you know, taking seven keto as a magic pill for weight loss. Mm hmm. So Which what are, there is some theory behind There's a little research behind it, but okay. usually people say it doesn't work. So it's an important sort of, uh, you know, is what's the interplay between cortisol and DHEA besides that sort of DHEA is sort of like the sort of good cop, bad cop situation, right? So that's it what you, that's what I kind of I heard you say just now. <laughs> I interpret. It is. <laughs> yeah. Especially when cortisol is high, obviously, you know, cortisol mm. can be a good cop too, but when it's being the bad cop and it's super high, and it's causing all these symptoms in somebody's body, especially in the brain, DHEA um, hopefully is the counter that goes up and says, whoa, stop damaging my neuronal cells and stop, you know, affecting my short-term memory. That's what DHEA helps counter. Mm, Okay. So what are some natural ways to increase DHEA? Adrenal support, right? It's made right in the adrenal. So doing adaptogenic herbs, um, for those of you who can prescribe, you can do DHEA itself as a, as a supplement, but I do, I do a lot of adrenal support Mm -hmm. to help it. Mm, Okay. Um, so, you know, getting back to the, the practicalities of being a practitioner. So when, what are the scenarios where you really think those are the times that you, you want to know hormone levels? I mean, a lot of times, you know, we, we're, like I said, we're naturopaths. So we, we treat hormones sometimes inadvertently because we help clean somebody's gut up or we, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we don't, I don't always do the testing because people tend to improve with our um, treatments. But what are some right. like red flags where you really want to know? what's going on well the, the, I completely agree with you and people will call me you know as the medical director for Dutch they'll go I have this case would you run a Dutch test and inevitably if they say I've done SIBO testing it's positive I'm going to put them on a whole protocol or I've done you know fecal testing they have all these infections blah 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 they're like should I do a Dutch test I'm like no always treat the gut always treat the gut first start there and then If they still have hormone symptoms, then at that point, consider doing um, 
doing hormone testing. You know, if you're if you're going along and your gut's getting a lot better, but they're still having hormone symptoms. The other big time, I'll of course do hormone testing. Um, you know, if they when women are having trouble getting pregnant or chronic miscarriage, um, people who are going through gut treatment and maybe feel worse, um, it's actually making the hormone symptoms worse. Then I'm like, all right, let's see how high or low your numbers are, how high or low is your estrogen, how high or low is your cortisol, or even your progesterone, right? You're going through, you're doing um, intestinal work with them, and um, turns out it's actually greatly affecting progesterone, or it's greatly affecting cortisol. So then we'll need some extra supplements to help them there. Mm -hmm. But I always start with the gut, always. Mm -hmm. And... um you know, getting back to the estrogen, because one of the things that we see is spe- sort of specifically with SIBO, of course, is endometriosis, right? Because yeah. of adhesions and uh, causing um, outflow problems where we, uh, where it just um, affects digestive functions due to structural problems and um, besides just the hormonal issues of excess estrogen. Do you see, besides excess estrogen, is there anything else that you see with that condition that may show up on a hormone test? Um, well, it just inflammation in general, you know, endometriosis mm-hmm. has a lot of just inflammatory cytokines, um, in, in research they show when they do, um, peritoneal fluid, look at look at the peritoneal fluid of, um, endometriosis women, you know, they're really high in things like IL-6 and just these pro-inflammatory cytokines. And then inflammation changes markers on hormone testing. It greatly affects hormones. And so we'll see maybe estrogen issues, but others, maybe other issues as the body's trying to deal with this chronic, either high grade or low grade, um, issue going on in the abdominal cavity. Mm, Right. All right. Um, sort of, you know, some other questions that came to my mind as you were talking is just like, you know, what's, what's on the horizons for, um, any sort of new developments in the field of hormonal testing, if anything at all, are you, you know, you guys are always adding new tests to your, to the profile, the the reports getting longer and longer. (laughs) We add well, and you know, prepare strap in because we're actually releasing six more markers, um, January 2nd, 2018. So we're, we're just, we're adding them at no charge. We're going to add, in um, six extra organic acid markers that relate to hormone testing. Wow. So we're super excited. So three of them are, yeah, three of them are neurotransmitter and three of them are nutritional. And Mm -hmm. uh, it'll help people just better understand, you know, from a nutritional standpoint, are you absorbing it? Do you have it? Are you getting it? And how is this affecting metabolism or how is this affecting, you know, infection, inflammation? And then neurotransmitter, of course, mood, the gut brain is, you Mm -hmm. know, we were you know, talking at beforehand or, um, with, with Bradley Bush, it's, it's, there's, it's so huge that gut brain connection and man, that can really affect mm-hmm. hormones, but then, you know, neurotransmitter, your brain hormones and your brain hormones are greatly tied to your male and female hormones and your adrenal hormones. So we're adding these, these couple of markers just, just to help point practitioners in the right direction. Like, Hey, look, <laughs> this is not good. <laughs> mm, that's really, wow. I'm looking forward to that. That's really helpful. I've yeah. been getting really into the, um, organic acids lately. You know, I've just been sort of diving deep into these different markers and it's, it's really interesting what kind of patterns you can, um, you can discern and how helpful that can be. Right. Okay. Do you have any other sort of insights for us? I mean, I know that I could ask you a whole bunch of questions. The material is so (laughs) dense, you know, that I think that probably also our level of conversation, some people, I'm hoping it's not (laughs) too much for them. We didn't even touch on testosterone yet, but, uh, you know, (laughs) we all all love it. One of the things I do (laughs) want to say though, is you had mentioned with, um, you know, you were talking about structural with endometriosis and SIBO and women who have, um, IBS type symptoms around their cycle. And, and one of my mentors had told me years and years ago, she said, you know, if the uterus is not in the right place, like if it's leaning backwards and it's pressing on the intestines, on the large intestines or the, you know, any of the intestines, as it gets closer to your menstrual, your menses, it fills up with blood. And so it goes from about, um, well in the U S right, we, we go from four ounces to eight ounces. So from like a small pair to a large pair. And my mentor was like, remember if that's pressing on the intestines, then you're going to get constipation. Mm -hmm. Because you literally have a blockage, your, your heavy uterus is pushing on it. And man, that has just been so eye opening to me. I was like, oh my gosh, you're not kidding. So structural is a Mm -hmm. huge thing. One, when it comes to intestinal health, 
you know, where you're, where you're the position of your guts and, you know, adhesions and things, but two, just, you know, where is the uterus? Is it leaning to the side? Is it leaning forward? Is it leaning backwards? Cause that right there will make a huge impact on whether somebody has constipation or not getting close to their period. Hmm. Well, so we're, like retroverted uterus is pretty common yep. uh, on pap smears. Back when I was doing pap smears in uh, um, Montana a long time ago, um, <laughs> you know, that was a uh, pretty common finding. So are you saying that uh, be- structurally there's something that I never thought of it? Like it, are there things that we can recommend uh, yeah. in terms of visceral manipulation or, or Ex- something exactly like that? Exactly that. So I- I recommend like their specific abdominal type massages that focus on you know, the pelvic bowl, pelvic cavity, visceral manipulation, um, um, just any kind of body work that's helping to release adhesions so that to pull the uterus, you know, more into a forward facing the belly button as opposed to just what you said, the, you know, facing backward, leaning backwards, I should say. Um, because again, mm-hmm. when it leans backwards and it fills up with blood, now you've got compression on the intestines and women go, why do I get why do I get constipation at my period? I'm like, does it alleviate when you start bleeding? They're like, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, yep. It's probably anatomical. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Um, okay. Um, other, th- you know, other random thoughts that come to me right now <laughs> <laughs> are things like flax seeds, right? So flax yes. seeds, I used to do a lot of flax seeds for my patients and lignans, um, ha- you know, really being helpful, uh, in, you know, talk to us about flax seeds, talk to us about soy. There's a, a huge misconception here in Australia, or at least when I came, that uh, soy products are uh, bad for you. Um, this is, of course, outside the scope of, of SIBO because we don't like flax and soy are not two foods that we recommend in active SIBO treatment. But can you talk to us about those two foods? Yeah. And I, with flaxseed, I just remind people like flaxseeds can be quite helpful from an estrogen point of view, you know, for estrogen dominance, but is it, it does raise sex hormone binding globulin, that SHBG mm-hmm. and SHBG preferentially binds up testosterone. So if you have a woman who is already struggling with her testosterone, she's already struggling with things like her low sex drive, low libido, then flaxseeds may not be the thing for her. You're, you'll actually own, only make it worse. And you may want to choose, you know, other binders like Dr. Shade was talking about. Um, and then when it comes to soy, um, definitely, unfortunately, and I'm sure the same in Australia, but as you know, in the United States, if, if we, if a little bit is good, then everything, you know, everything soy must be good. So we have soy protein powder and soy protein bars and we have, you know, soy to make it look like chicken and we have soy to make it look like hamburger meat. And it's like, oh my gosh, but the fermented soys, um, you know, some really good reasons research on that in regards to, again, that like estrogen balance, especially menopausal women, um, who are, um, struggling with hot flashes and night sweats. And so when people say, can I do fermented soy? Can I have miso soup? Can I do edamame? I'm like, yeah, sure. That's, that's probably mm. a whole lot better for you mm. than doing, you know, all your protein bars, soy based and soy milk and soy protein powder and right. soy cookies and soy hamburger meat. <laughs> and not to mention GMO, right? So that's a whole, right. a whole oh nother gosh. level of wrongness. Right? So, so we don't even go there, but, but yeah. Right. So, and it's my understanding, you know, and, this was more in line with that uh, some practitioners think that soy is estrogenic and therefore will increase your total estrogen. But it's my understanding that you actually have alpha and beta estrogen receptors and um, that soy actually uh, is a phytoestrogen, but it actually downregulates the more proliferative type of estrogen. Um, because what we know from studies is that certain amount of isoflavones from soy have been shown to reduce uh, recurrence of breast cancer and is also really helpful with um, total estrogenic load. Has, has that been yeah. your experience? Yeah. And if I tell people like, I'm like, just go do it. Just go Google search. Just do a PubMed search on isoflavones and you will see a lot of really neat information out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I had to had that conversation a few times with fellow practitioners um, that, that don't really understand the physiology of sort of... Um, 
Sorry. But anyways, leaving on a note of uh, that <laughs> there's a lot of exciting things happening in your arena. Unfortunately, you're not taking new patients or any patients at all. We always have a whole bunch of patients listening to this because patients are used to being their own practitioners these days and looking for mm -hmm. answers to their multitude of issues because there's so many different layers to so many different uh, conditions that uh, sometimes even uh, just specializing in one area is not good enough. You need to understand a lot of these different and um, contributing factors. So what is happening uh, in the next year besides new markers for you, actually? For me, I'm, I'm all education. My primary, my 2018 goal is to, I'm writing um, a guidebook that will hopefully be ready Uh, not a formal book, but it's a, you know, it's a hormone guidebook that will be ready probably in the January timeframe and then continuing to, um, create courses and videos and, um, handouts to, to make hormone health easy to understand for practitioners or, you know, even just the consumer who is listening and really struggling with their own health. And maybe their, their, their GP is not understanding where they're coming from or telling them they're normal. And of course they don't feel normal. So my goal is to help those people really understand, you know, the adrenals, their ovaries, the testes, the thyroid, and then of course tie it in with all the wonderful things like what you do at SIBO test. And so that's mm -hmm. my 2018 goal. Wonderful. Well, it looks like we're going to be pretty busy, Carrie. <laughs> I think so, too. Because <laughs> that's our goal here, too, um, at the SIBO Doctor. So, look, thank you so much for your time. Uh, for listeners, you can go to the show notes. Dr. Jones's details are all there, and her contact details, the Dutch profile, or the Precision Analytic Lab uh, details are there as well. Um, yeah, thank you so much for your time, and I'm sure we'll have you back on the show because it is a never-ending topic, you know, with this, it with is. hormones. <laughs> <laughs> It's a popular.